yapılması gerekiyor. Okay. So you can hear me okay? It's okay? The sounds? Assalamu alaikum, Mr. Uh, Good evening, everybody. My name is Abraham Shreya. I'm a neurosurgeon, and we are transmitting live from Farah Medical Campus here in Amman, Jordan. Uh, just to remind you, these are the Leonardo da Vinci anatomical drawings some hundred years ago. I think people know Leonardo DiCaprio more than they know Leonardo da Vinci. Um, orbital intraconal cavern is our topic for tonight, and that needs some anatomy because of the orbit, right orbit, left orbit. In the orbit, we have the rule of seven, meaning seven bones, seven arteries, seven veins. Bones are frontal bone, sphenoid bone, greater wing, diagrammatic bone, maxillary bone, lacrimal bone, ethmoid bone, and the palatine bone. And the arteries, of course, the thermal artery, the central retinal artery, anterior, ethmoidal, posterior, ethmoidal, supratracheal, supraorbital, and the angular branch of the fascia, with their corresponding venous drainage. So, rule of seven in the orbit. Severe walls made by the frontal bone, and then we have the ethmoid bone making the medial wall. Fear wall is made by the maxilla and the lateral wall is made by the sphenoid bone. If you look at the severe orbital fissure, and this is the optic canal. 
Optic analysis is not seen in the straightforward look at it, so you have to move the skull a little bit to see the uh, optic canal. But this is the severe orbital fissure, this is the inferior orbital fissure. Notice the relationship with the maximum. So here we are seeing the optic canal and the severe orbital fissure. And this is the maxilla. If you take the maxilla out the anterior wall, then you will see the rest of the severe orbital fissure, and you will see the uh, foramen rotundum, and you'll see immediately the uh, foramen for uh, the vein of uh, canal, median canal. We're looking at the left eye. Why did I choose the left eye? Because we're talking about left eye pathology, the patient with left eye pathology. So the eyelid, the tarsal plate, there is a tarsal plate in the upper uh, lid and the tarsal plate in the lower lid. If you go into the apex of the orbit, you will see the anterior gem, the optic nerve, and the muscles coming out of it. This is the lacrimal gland, laterally. So these are the muscles. This is the globe. This is one on the left side. And you can see the severe oblique, the severe rectus, the medial rectus, fear rectus, and fear oblique, lateral rectus. And if you see the cut, this is the left orbit, this is the globe, you'll see two muscles, the severe rectus, on top of it, there is the levator papillary superioris. Here is the medial rectus, here is the inferior rectus, inferior oblique, lateral rectus, and this is the lacrimal gland. These are the ophthalmic veins. So you'll see the optic nerve with its central artery and vein, and around it there is some arachnoid space and the dura. Again, lateral rectus, medial rectus, superior rectus, inferior rectus, levator papillary superioris, superior oblique, and how it looks on the image. If you look at it from the top, on the left side, right side is here, red line, left side, you'll see bone, <coughs> which is the <coughs> orbital plate of the frontal bone. If you remove that, you'll come to the periorbital. If you remove the periorbital, you can see a, a nerve underneath the periorbital, which is the frontal nerve. Remove the periorbital, you will see the uh, periorbital fat and the nerve, frontal nerve. Remove the periorbital, remove the fat. You will see the two muscles, levator palpebris superioris, underneath it is superior rectus. Medial is medial rectus, lateral is lateral rectus. This is the lacrimal nerve going to the lacrimal gland. Anatomy that can be done by God himself cannot be done by anything else. There has to be a creator who's done this beautifully in the fashion it is done. So the globe, the optic nerve, and the various nerves. This is the oculomotor nerve, the lacrimal nerve, central artery, and the giving us anterior thymoidal and posterior thymoidal and anterior thymoidal artery. It's a complex anatomy, but once you know it, it's easy. <coughs> Again, you're looking from the top, right orbit, left orbit. And if you make a cut here, you'll see the globe. And these are the muscles, medial rectus and lateral rectus. So we speak of the cone. Cone means the cone, like the ice cone, ice clam cone. Uh, so anything inside this is called intraconal. Anything outside it is called extraconal. So lacrimal gland is extraconal. There is fat in the extraconal space. Fat in the extraconal space. Here is the optic nerve. Fat in the intraconal space. And this is how it looks on the images. The globe, the optic nerve, the lateral rectus, the medial rectus. So this is called medial compartment. Interconal, this is called lateral compartment. This is lateral compartment, this is medial compartment. Again, if you look at the sorry for that. If you look at the the orbit laterally, again, I'm concentrating on the left. Uh, orbit anatomy, so you will see the zygomatic arch. This is the lateral wall of the orbit. You open it, you'll see the periorbital. 
you can with the bin orbiter like this. So this is the lift orbit as seen from the lateral uh, view, and this is the peri orbiter. Remove the peri orbiter, you'll see the lateral rectus. Here is the inferior rectus, here is the superior rectus. Why am I showing this? Because you'll see it in the movie. So you better acquaint yourself with this anatomy. We'll be going between this muscle and this muscle here to remove the tumor. So the lacrimal gland, the globe, the lateral rectus, and we'll be going into this space. If you don't know the anatomy, you will cause havoc to the patient. You'll destroy your patient. Anatomical knowledge is essence. Is the essence actually. So basically, this is it. The globe controlled by these muscles, inferior obliques, severe obliques, severe rectus, inferior rectus, lateral rectus, middle rectus. And here is, we have cut the lateral rectus. You can see the optic nerve, the ciliary ganglion, the long and short ciliary nerves, and so on. If you have a cut like this, this is the globe, this is the optic nerve, this is the fat, which is within the cone of the muscles. And if you follow, this is the severe rectus. This is the levator by superioris. And they are divided into two parts. Part that goes into the upper eyelid and part that goes into the tarsus of the upper eyelid. This is called molar muscle. So who's interested in the orbit? Everybody. Of course, the ophthalmologist, the oculoplastic. And I just want you to watch that there's only, I think, one ophthalmologist here tonight, although they have all been invited. They just don't want to hear anything about it. Uh, neurosurgeons and neurologists are very much interested. We always say the eye is the window of the brain. If you look into the eye, you'll see lots of pathology. Maxilla fascia, the ENT, the oncologist, the interventional radiologist, the radiotherapist, and the internist. Internists are very much interested in the orbits with all these autoimmune diseases and so on. So it's a common ground for so many specialists. But I have to tell you, this was originally the land of the neurosurgeon. Dandy used to do all his orbital lesions on his own. If you look at the pathology, you would see by just looking at the orbit, this is orbital cellulitis, foreign body, look at this. It's the same look, this is the pseudotumor uh, orbital inflammation, autoimmune disease, very much like this. For this, thyroid orbitopathy. Here are a group of tumors that look the same. So you have to be careful. And people who say, oh, this is rare, this is nothing rare. In medicine, everything can face you, everything can come across you. So we'll talk about the orbital problems in terms of diseases or tumors. Tumors, inflammation, infection, congenital diseases, vascular diseases, and this, the disease of the orbit, which is the idiopathic orbital pseudotumor. Many people don't know about the existence of this. Thyroid ortho orthomopathy, the lymphoproliferative disease, the webinar granulomas, sarcoidosis, amyloidosis. How many of us in this room remember the amyloidosis? IgGG4 disease, Michelin's disease, which can affect all the salivary glands. So our topic for tonight is the orbital tumor. So we'll speak about the primary orbital tumors. They are rare. And it's the best to think about them in terms of structures. What tumors affect the globe? Metanoblastoma, UVL, melanoma. What tumors affect the optic nerve? Meningiomas and gliomas. What tumors affect the intracoronal, the mangioma, extracoronal, the carcinomas, rhabdomyosarcoma, sarcoma, etc. So there may be extension from the bone and the sinuses to the orbit, or there may be something affecting multiple compartments. This is the best way to think about orbital tumors. This is a very nice paper, review of 244 orbital tumors in Japan, published 2004. 244 cases, 213 were primary or between. So primary is more than the secondary. Extracoronal is more than the intracoronal. Remember the pathology that affects the lacrimal gland. It's huge. And 
This is the 213 primary orbital tumors. What is the commonest? Lymphomas. Lymphomas and lymphoid hyperplasia. What is the commonest in the intracorneal uh, orbital tumors? Meningioma, glioma, optic sheet meningioma. What is the commonest in the extracorneal lymphoid? Lymphoma. People forget about lymphoma. It's there. So if we look generally at what are the adult orbital tumors, malignant lymphoma, malignant hyperplasia, and pleomorphic adenoma, adenocarcinoma. Well, if you look at the pediatric group, it's mostly benign. 80% are benign. They're mild, glioma, cataracanogenoma. So adult tumors are usually malignant, Pediatric tumors are usually benign. This is the message. So in children, 80% are benign, 2% are malignant, 20%. One case published in the Indian Journal, Indian Ophthalmology Journal. Indian Ophthalmology Journal. Do we have Arab Ophthalmology Journal? No, because we don't believe on research and papers. We just want to get money and do no research, no, nothing about progressive medicine. India is very, very aggressive in their publications. Pediatric tumors of the orbit, 2013, and pediatric neurosurgery. In neurosurgery journals, we have the other journal, we have the pediatric journal, we have the spinal journal, we have the minimally invasive, four journals from one institute, which is the CNS. So 30 pediatric patients in this period of time, majority are benign. Another paper in general, 122 patients in this period of time from Poland, mostly malignant adults. This is my daughter, Asil. Hello, Asil. Uh, this is from Poland, Markowski, 122 orbital tumors, mostly malignant. So, what is cavernoma, which is our topic for tonight? My interest in cavernoma is. It was back to 1986 when I published this paper in the Journal of Neurosurgery. I was just still starting uh, my uh, neurosurgical career. I just finished my residency. That's Journal of Neurosurgery, 1986. Why? I was forced to do this paper. I was crying. Please, boss, give me time. I want to read for my exams. He hell, you go and do this paper. So I had to do the paper and I passed the exam. So we work under pressure. This is when I was at the Athens Memorial Hospital. At that time, they used to be called cryptic AVMs. So this is the paper. To publish something in the Journal of Neurosurgery, if you publish one paper, you have something. So it is called cavernoma. Forget all about these terminologies. They are gone. Nobody is using them. Cryptic AVM because they were not seen on angiography. Cavernous malformation, it's not. Occult malformation, cavernous angioma, cavernous angioma, no. The terminology that's accepted internationally is cavernoma. Still, you see the radiology report speaking about cavernous angioma. It's called cavernoma. It's a tuft of results, endothelial results like this. They grow by angiogenesis. They are ovoid in shape. They have pseudo capsule. So it is said there are tangle of vessels that resemble a blackberry. They do exactly look like blackberry. And I love blackberry, but I don't eat these. These are tumors that I excise. What is the difference between cavernoma and the cranial or the orbits? Major differences. Behavior is different. The cranial cavernoma is different from the orbital cavernoma. Orbital cavernomas are encapsulated, rarely bleed. Cerebral cavernomas are usually not encapsulated and usually bleed. Come out in females, which is lucky for us males. Why? Because they have progesterone receptors in the epithelial cells. The age is this 30 to 60 years, but remember it can happen in children. So, this is the progesterone receptor expression in the orbital cavernomas. It is established. They have progesterone receptors in the cells. 
and the bacillus cells of the Kerbena Sinon germ. Just like they have progesterone receptor in male germs, that's why both are common in females. Remember that in children, you can have the orbital carbonomas coexisting with these cutaneous or choroidal carbonomas. So whenever you see this, maybe they have something inside. Locations, anywhere in the orbit. Different, I've chosen different, uh, different uh, cases, so that they can happen anywhere. But they love the outer compartment. This is their favorite site, the outer compartment. But they can be interosseous within the bone, inside the bone. They can be intraorbital and extraorbital in the cavernous sinus and outside, like this paper from Italy. Uh, can they be bilateral? Yes. It says, are bilateral carbonomas do exist? Are they real? Yes, they are. So they show these cases of bilateral cavernous germs or carbonomas. Bilateral orbital cavernous germ, still using the old name. This is published in the Asian Journal in Tunisia. Tunis are active in North Africa. Tunis and uh, Morocco are active in publication, far more than Egypt and Libya and others. So they put the literature where they have bilateral orbital carbonomas, the authors and the cases. So bilateral carbonomas do exist. Uh, if you have a case and you want to treat it and send it for the insurance company, they would say, carbonomas are congenital, you don't treat it. Why? Because the insurance company, they play games on us, doctors, and play games on doctors. They just want to gain some money. So they say, oh, this is congenital, we don't treat it. Tell them it is not congenital, it could be acquired. It could be acquired, like inheritance like this, autosomal dominance. What about the radiology of the carbonomas? CT, MRI, ultrasound, FTG, PET, PET scan, and SPECT. There is something called the Frankfurt line or Frankfurt plane. This is the middle fossa, anterior edge, middle fossa, anterior edge. This is the, the greater lumbar sphenoid. If you do a line like this, here you are in the apex of the orbit. Here you are not in the apex. This is the most difficult part of the orbit to operate. Orbital apex. The rest here easier than this one. And once you do the outline, beyond it, you compare, you divide this by 120 degrees, 120 degrees compartment. A, it's called uh, superior lateral, B, superior medial, C, inferior. So now you can speak the same language. Where is the tumor? You can say exactly what it is. T1 is intense to T2 hyper intense. It is well demarcated. It has pseudo capsule, and you better do fat suppression even after contrast. Different uh, images of the carbonomas, <coughs> how they look in different sequences T1, T2, etc. And this is called Fiesta. Fiesta because you can. Look at the whole length of the optic nerve. So this is the globe, this is the optic nerve, so, the rectus. so you look at the whole length from anterior or the whole length from posterior. What about contrast enhancing? If you give, this is before contrast enhancing, initially some enhancement and then there is late enhancement. Remember this, small enhancement, bigger enhancement and then, so called progressive enhancement. Please. How you can differentiate between cavernous and hemangioma? Yes, hemangioma and cavernoma. It's the same as uh, the pattern of enhancement. Yes, so yes. These things can be enhanced. They are the same. Cavernomas and cavernous hemangiomas are the same. They are the same different uh, labels, but we are speaking of the same pathology. So, SPECT there can be delayed uptake. Angiogram, you better look at the uh, Thalamic artery and see the branches, the, how it's uh, done, whether it supplies the, uh, the tumor or not. You will see the venous drainage here from this tumor going into the cavernous sinus. 
And here, this is a beautiful view. You can see the karate, you can see that the ophthalmic artery going like this on top of the optic nerve and then going this way. So it goes this way and then this way. Here, because there is a tumor, it is compressed. So angiography can be of great uh, importance. How do they manifest these tumors? Protrusion or proptosis, it is 100%. If the tumor is more than one centimeter, you will have proptosis. Limitation of the eye movements, double vision, decreased visual acuity, redness or swelling, headaches, headaches, or retroorbital pain. You can see the proptosis, you can use something called proptosis index, see the angle here and the angle here, or as you said, you draw the line at the back of the globe or the, the Frankfurt line. When you want to see the proptosis, you always look from above. Here, of course, it's so obvious, the right eye is proptotic. But if the proptosis is minimal, the best view is this. Right eye is proptotic. Here, next to sheep, same thing. Left eye. So maybe here you miss it, but this way you will not miss it. Tangential, look. Put the patient in a chair and look on top. Again, you will not miss this, but here, look the difference. Same here. Look at this here. You may find signs of increased intra intraocular pressure. And we have to stop using the palpation method. This is old method. Oh, yes, the pressure is normal. Uh, you have to measure the intraocular pressure. You can look into the fundus and you can find papilledema, or optic atrophy, or choroidal folds. Sometimes they present acutely, although they don't read. But these are cases against the rule. They bled. Acute presentation of cavernous hemangioma of the orbit by bleeding from the USA. Again, the treatment involves all these people. It is not for ophthalmologists. It is not. It is for all these people. Cooperation would lead to progress. Sometimes you need to do it needle aspiration. Fine needle aspiration. It's important diagnostic examination that should be performed whenever there is no contraindication. I'd like to call upon Dr. Farid Adham to also tell us about the aspiration and maybe using the thing for treatment. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brahim. Um, and um, it's always a pleasure to be here again and uh, always uh, interesting to learn something new. Um, aspirating this lesions, uh, we rarely ever have to do it to diagnose it because uh, I think with the imaging characteristics we have, almost always you can come to a good uh, assumption of the diagnosis. Uh, so, um, but I was asked to talk about, is there another option besides the major surgery you will see later about the case we presented? Because uh, there is different ways to treat these patients and depending on the patient situation, um, the minimal invasive uh, ways uh, does have a good actually results and uh, may help patients avoid um, uh, some significant surgery as the one that you will see next. Um, so I'm, I will not go into details what about the science behind it, all the history and data. I will show a, re, uh, a case, a patient, that we did uh, and the results with, for this patient. This is a 36 year old, an engineer, had uh, proptosis for a long time uh, with some re uh, actually difficulty in um, uh, right nasal uh, passages. And he actually had underwent an attempt of resection um, that was aborted due to, risk to the bleeding issue. So he lived actually after that for years, not knowing what to do, consulting people. So eventually um, was referred to us for evaluation. So this is uh, the MRI of the patient. As you could see, uh, we have um, a type of uh, lesion where there is a well-defined multi-lobulated lesion, intraconal, large lesion resulting in uh, compression of the 
uh, optic nerve, which you see part of it here. The region does extend almost to the, co to the uh, orbital uh, apex. It's obviously causing significant portosis and uh, very typical characteristics, not on the, on the T1 images, low isotope muscle, uh, high T2, and we'll see the enhancement. This is one of the interesting cases because this has the multi-compartmental extension of the region because you have the intracoronal compartment and you have extra, uh, extra orbital compartment in, inside the nose, very similar characteristics. This was when at time of surgery, actually a piece was taken of, the, of that and was uh, by pathologist read as cavernous hemangioma, uh, which is cavernoma. This was, um, uh, very, um, this is both contrast, and you see the uh, enhancement in this lesion. This is T1, T1 both, and they are enhancing avidly. They are strongly enhancing lesions. And characteristic wise, uh, they fit the diagnosis of the pathology. So, pathologically and imaging, and six years almost between the time of surgery and the time I saw him, he was having the same issues, not much progression. And angiography was done in uh, another institution, and that was negative for any high vascular abnormality. So um, you have such a large lesion, and I would, uh, if the time would have allowed, we would have asked Dr. Prahim as a neurosurgeon how would he approach this lesion. This is an, a large lesion uh, that will typically present a significant challenge from the surgical approach. Um, especially that this has multi-compartmental approaches. So the way we approach this uh, is uh, relatively um, in a minimally invasive way. Um, patient, uh, this was obviously evaluated by the ophthalmologist, uh, all and uh, an oculoblastic uh, person have seen him before, a specialist, and his intraocular pressure was slightly elevated. He had actually effect of, of the optic nerve, um, to a, a, a mild degree. However, when we discussed the treatment, we offered him um, a novel technique of treating these lesions, which essentially percutaneous access into the tumor. That's what you see an example here. So we bring the patient in, we access it with just small needles under ultrasound and fluoroscopy guidance. This is obviously the orbit. We um, uh, in, in, uh, under ultrasound, we access these uh, lesions by needles, and this was injected with bleomycin. Bleomycin, uh, as you know, is a, an uh, anti-tumoral and uh, antibiotic, but most of the people remember it as anti-tumoral, uh, anti-cancerous uh, treatment. It has a lot of characteristics that has been proven over the years that it has an effect over these lesions and actually has significant effect over multiple vascular lesions, not only cavernomas. Uh, that the, the challenge with such a patient is making sure that you have control over the intraorbital pressure, intraocular pressure, because you don't want to elevate it to an extent where you cause damage to the nerve. Um, these cases are done with the ophthalmologist in the room, measuring the intraorbital pressure before we start, after anesthesia, while we are injecting, there is actually a way where they measure it with a pen, and we have a very strict control of the intraocular pressure. So what you will see here is um, an example how we access. If you look at this, not knowing the AB view, you would think there's a needle going through the, the globe. It's actually obviously going alongside the globe into the tumor. Uh, if this uh, works, uh, you will see um, right now some of uh, works. Uh, this will illustrate, um, not available for what, some reason, this would illustrate the injection of contrast inside the tumor. You see the blush here uh, of the tumor. This is the needle inside the tumor. This is contrast. We inject contrast to assess the location, the spread of the treatment that we will offer inside the tumor, and as well, in where is the drainage? Where does that medication will go? Would it stay in the tumor? Is there uh, actually extension of it? into the cavernous sinus, and that has indication on the treatment. Um, I would love to see if this video will work, but it will not. Um, so um, moving forward, this is again showing the frontal view. As you could see, this actually needle going 
next to the globe intracornally into the tumor, uh, contrast injection showing that um, uh, location. Uh, obviously, we see the globe very clearly with ultrasound. With fluoroscopy, you don't have that access. So this patient underwent two sessions of pleomycin injection into the tumor, and that was done purposely. We had treated the, the anterior aspect of the tumor first, uh, shrink that, and then we treated the more posterior aspect next to the, uh, in the apex of the orbit. And that's how things looked. So this is how he looked before treatment. First session and second post uh, the last session. It was, uh, this patient was, um, uh, have a dramatic improvement with only two sessions. As you could see, almost the intracornal compartment, almost clear with a very, very small residual this tumor. His proptosis dramatically improved. The interesting part, which we, we saw when we were treating him, is that if you look at the intranasal compartment, um, that was here, eventually, if you look at the last image, it shrunk more than 80% because of the communication. This is, again, uh, both treatment, both second stage. You see that there is the nerve now completely free. There is nothing pushing on the nerve. So if you look before and after, uh, this is how he looked before. This is how we looked after. This patient's um, proptosis uh, resolved. His optic nerve uh, had normal functioning. So he had, luckily he didn't have long-term damage. Uh, and for now he avoided surgery. So this is one technique you could use uh, to treat such lesions. This applies to multiple sites, not necessarily intraorbital, but this is obviously very, a critical site, but we implement this in a lot of times, uh, different places in the body, especially critical places. Thank you for the opportunity, uh, Dr. Fahim. Thanks. So you know, you now know of a new technique, uh, another technique, alternative technique for this uh, thing. Okay, so surgery is the main stay, but remember that if you find this incidentally, it doesn't mean that you have to remove it. It has to be symptomatic. And the aim of surgery is to take the tumor totally in block and avoid injury to the surrounding structures. If you have a case, then give it to the ophthalmologist, he will use the transcranial tablet or the lateral orbitotomy. If you give it to the neurosurgeon, he will use the transcranial or lateral orbitotomy. But there are so many approaches, transcranial tablet, supraorbital, lateral orbitotomy, transcranial, transantral, and endoscopy. Until approaches, transcranial this is the right eye, this is the middle aspect. You can cut the medial canthus and proceed inside. This is the anterior ethmoidal artery. Transconjunct tablet for this legion. You do flap of the conjunct tablet, then you slide inside. Transconjunct tablet from South Korea. This tumor, again, remove it with the cryoprobe. Another transcranial tablet from Turkey, large tumor. Transcranial tablet again, South Korea. This is the globe. They have one here. This one, light proptosis. This is the tumor taken out through the conjunct Same thing here. Sometimes they put a, a uh, some kind of cotton loop around the muscles so that they can pull it and see the relationship with the muscles. You can do the vertical lid like this, vertical lid, and then go through transcranial table. You can go supraorbital just to take the supraorbital limb of this lift orbit and then go into the orbit itself. Or you can use the lateral orbitotomy, the lateral wall of the orbit. This is the, the left orbit, and you can remove the lateral wall like this. You cut here at the frontozygomatic or the zygomatic orbital here, suture, remove this bone, you'll gain more access. And then you can fix it with these uh, small pieces. Lateral orbitotomy from Turkey. 
the when you when you mention orbital tumors, you have to mention the name of somebody, which is Joseph Maron. Joseph is a friend of mine. He's from the Maronites of Lebanon. He's a great man, a great leader, and he spent his life doing orbital surgery. He's a neurosurgeon. So he, he if you look at the publications, you can find most of the publication done by yourself and this group. As again, to mention it again, neurosurgeons who were the masters of the orbit. And then came the others. <clears throat> this is another paper of the lateral orbit atomy from Iran. Uh, you can use transcreen. We usually use the front orbital or front orbital zygomatic. And you can go like this frontal lobe, temporal lobe, and then you have the whole orbit in front of you like this. You can see the orbit in front. It's a beautiful view. You can have the full control of the orbit wherever you like to go. But you have to have good anatomy knowledge. Endoscopy, a creep in, and it's important. Uh, it's used for biopsy or accession of small benign lesions. That's how it started. But then it just uh, rocketed sky high. Uh, seeing the light, endoscopic endonasal intracornal orbital tumor. You go into the sphenoid sinus and then change direction and you go to the orbit. Uh, this is from the Carlson Snyderman the group, uh, Snyderman, Gardner, and Dominica Sam. Endoscopy for this tumor. Here's the covered artery of the canal and then the mass of the apex. Endoscopy, transnasal. This is a very famous paper now, and it is from USA, published in the Journal of Neurology, Neurological Surgery. And look at this cooperation. We in this part of the world don't believe in cooperation. It's a solo game. I am the one when the others should die. It's not like this. Paul Gardner and Snyderman are endoscopists. Joseph Marone is a neurosurgeon. Fernandez Miranda is an ENT surgeon. They are playing together to give us the best. They call it round the clock surgical access to the orbit. We can reach anywhere through this approach. And they give you examples. The regions according to where they are and how they can approach it. Beautiful paper. Uh, Joseph Maroon now is in retirement. He's doing some yoga classes. Endoscopy in the, in the nasal or transit model approach. Again from Japan. And you can use it for malignant tumors. Again, from Japan, this is endoscopy for resection of locally aggressive tumors. From here, you can go this way, and this way, and this way, and this way. Endoscopy is the future of neurosurgery. If I am a resident, I will choose to go into endoscopy from now. Again, different examples of different regions and how they approach it by endoscopy. Just reading this paper gives you insight into new anatomy. It's a very pleasurable feeling. My series of intraorbital tumors, 120 cases, 85 since I came from England to 2018, mostly females, benign tumors, 72, malignants, 28, others, 26. Examples of cavernomas. 40 year old male patient with this cavernoma. Before surgery, and after surgery, in the early years. Another male from Jordan, 30 year old male with this tumor causing proptosis. This is a surgery and this is the post operative. And this very, very challenging case of orbital apex cavernoma, uh, which we use you know, intradurally, transcranially, very difficult case before surgery and after surgery. Our case for tonight, I'll go through quickly. This male patient, 42-year-old male patient, Jordanian, he had headaches and proptosis. And that's the man with no limitation of my movements, just the proptosis and the headaches. Images showing this tumor. As I said, cavernoma, they love the lateral compartment. So this is the optic nerve being pushed. This is the lateral rectus. 
of the canal being pushed, so it is attached, it is uh, in touch with the optic nerve. The most drastic complication for this surgery is blindness. Imagine you do surgery for this patient and you get him blind. <coughs> it's a disaster. And you get him blind simply because you don't know anatomy and you have not been well trained. So that's the tumor. And the colon review. So this is the the two muscles, superior rectus, stivator, papillary superioris, medial rectus, superior rectus, and fetal leg, this is the optic nerve. So I know where to go. I'd like to go this way, between this muscle and this muscle, bilateral orbitotomy. If you give it to ophthalmologist, you would use transconjunctival corpus of the lateral orbitotomy. So it's the concept that you would do it. And in combination, it would be nice. I don't, I love to have the ophthalmologist and the visual auxiliary surgeon with me. And I love to use navigation. It is a teamwork, it's not a solo uh, thing. So this is the lateral view, and this is a tumor. Again. The study of the images with the view of anatomy knowledge gives you the courage to go in and operate on this patient. And we did angiogram, the MRA, and you can see again, this is the ophthalmic artery coming off the dorsal aspect of the internal carotid artery at the carotid cave. It goes like this through optic canal, above the optic nerve, jumps over it, and then go immediately to give the posterior thermoidal and the anterior thermoidal, and ending with the suborbital arteries. What is the differential diagnosis of this case? Easy you would find that it is not easy. All these are cases that has been pathologically proven. So I'm not lying to you, I'm not putting you labels. These are pathologically confirmed. This is lacrimal gland tumor, retinoblastoma, cyanasal carcinoma, capillary hemangioma, dermoid, one of my cases, adenoma of the, of the lacrimal gland, Adenocystic carcinoma and mucobacterial carcinoma. Osteoma, osteoblastoma of the orbit. Amyloblastoma, starting in the maxilla going into the orbit. Osteosarcoma, giant cell tumor involving the whole of the orbit. Rhabdomyosarcoma, rhabdomyosarcoma of the orbit, yes. There is pathology like this, but because you don't know, you don't think about it. You just look into the activation, ah, I see you, show you that now, look over. Cyanasal carcinoma, squamous carcinoma, undifferentiated carcinoma, lacrimal gland pathology, clavus cordoma involving the orbits, angiofibroma involving the orbits, histocytosis, and this is one of my cases which we presented, venous malformation looking like a tumor, venous malformation of the orbit. Sphenoorbital meningiomas, one of my cases involving the orbit. Neurofibroma involving the frontal branch of the transgeminal of V1. Hematoma, just hematoma, due to trauma. Idiopathic perineuritis, Pagets disease of the bone of the orbit. Fibrous dysplasia, one of my patients, Iraqi patient. Inverted papilloma, cyanasal fibroma, it's a benign disease. One of my patients, chondroid sarcoma, supraorbital vein dilated, looking back at tumor, lymphangioma with, uh, with the fluid level, nasopharyngeal carcinoma, genocystic carcinoma, rhabdosarcoma, owing sarcoma, nasopharyngeal, glyboscopedoma, chondrosarcoma, metastasis. Metastasis in the lateral pictures. Metastasis love to go anywhere. So they can go on. Lymphoma, which we always forget about. The seizure neuroblastoma coming from the nasal area. Ductal carcinoma of the lacrimal system. Plasmocytoma, one patient of mine. Fungal infection, one patient of mine. Allergic rhinitis, orbital cellulitis. Sarcoidosis, forgotten disease. Mucosil. Fungal infection, as you mentioned, echinococcus, echinococcus granulosis in the orbit. 
I put this group together, optic gliomas, different sizes and shapes. Here they are affecting the optic tract. Meningiomas, this is the easiest part of the simplest part or the earliest part. It's called the tram track sign, like a tram line. This is involving the optic nerve to some of the use. This is large tumor and so on. Thyroid orbitopathy, as if it has gone. It is not. We still see thyroid orbitopathy with the muscles and the fibrous tissue being thickened. And the forgotten disease really is the idiopathic orbital pseudotumor, so-called pseudotumor. It is autoimmune disease inflammation, dacroadenitis involving the lacrimal gland, involving the ethmoid, involving the lacrimal gland again, bilateral cigogna syndrome, causing the dryness of the eyes, dryness, lacrimal inflammation as mentioned. Uh, Toulouse Hunter disease, again, autoimmune disease like this, optic hemolytis, there is involvement of the cavernous sinus, scleritis, and peritonitis, all for Toulouse Hunter syndrome. So you see, we don't think of these uh, differential diagnoses simply because we don't know, simply because we don't want to know, because this would put burden on us to read and keep up to date. I challenge. So many neurosurgeons who just finished the, the neurosurgery board exam, if they have come back to any book to read or any paper to read, they've just finished the exam, they are consultants, consultants, and they just proceed through life with ignorance. Can we go back to the course? Just really I'd like to add to the differential. The uh, chief of the Dirich Department, uh, Jordan University Hospital. The, the hemangiopericytoma is the one which appears similar. You can't differentiate between the cavernoma and the hemangiopericytoma. The other one, which is slightly difficult to get, is the lymphatic proliferative disease. If we go back to the images which doctor, for the same patient, the only thing you have to they always to ask your radiologist is to do images without uh, with fat saturation except the T2. Okay, if we go that images, yeah. So, first, this is with contrast T1. This is not accepted to be done without fat sat. The uh, images to see the enhancement, you don't need a long time for cavernoma. Cavernoma do enhance in two to three minutes. So you don't wait for five minutes, 10 minutes, to like <coughs> and on the liver. Usually you do image every 30 seconds to see the complete, usually within three minutes, it is completely opacified. Can we go, please? Here, this is T2, and it is done fat sat. It is not good. You should see T2 without fat sat to see the chemical shift. The chemical shift is very good for you. It will show you the pseudo capsule of the leech. Next, please. Here, this is T2, and this is without fat cell. Yeah, here we are seeing the capsule, but we are not seeing the chemical shape. Okay? And this is without fat cell. These are, this is done without fat, with fat cell, while these are done without fat cell. This is the T2, this is T1, all these T1, except this is the T2, which should be done without fat set to see the chemical. Okay, that's it. Now that raises a question, Asmi. Should we write down to the radiologist what to do, or should the radiologist have the knowledge to do what, to, what he should do? Uh, I find it strange that radiologists look at these images after the patient has left the compound. It's not good. These pictures should be seen by the radiologist when the patient is still on the table. I always ask for the technicians of the radiology department to be available. Don't allow the patient to go home without consulting with your boss to see whether you need to do any further images. So these are the rest of the images and differential diagnosis. We did a few consultations, Dr. Farid, 
uh, you did the angiogram for this patient and you found that there's a feeder from the uh, left of the artery. And here it is. This is the thalamic artery and the feeder and the rest of the angiogram. So we don't leave any stone unturned. We need to know everything about this patient so that we can operate safely on them. Good medicine is expensive medicine. Poor medicine is not expensive. Uh, Dr. Naim Sadat was not available, he's traveling. He did the OCT for this patient and did the ophthalmology, which was within normal. And he was anesthetized by Dr. Abbas Tawil, who announced the patient set for general anesthesia. And this is the constant flow. We mentioned everything about it. Uh, I did a lateral orbitotomy and I used the navigation. Surgery. Very short movie, we will finish before eight. So the whole thing will not take more than a few minutes. Okay, very good. Can you hear me okay, Dr. Abraham? Here, this is the left orbit. We have done lateral orbitotomy. This is the uh, lacrimal gland. I'm doing here the suborbital run to be in more axis. You use the diamond uh, drill. And I can always keep telling the best drillers in the world, the ENT surgeons, and I learned how to drill from them. You drill with the side of the, the drill. This is the lacrimal gland. And I use the application. Here I'm retracting the lacrimal gland, anterior and lateral. I'm using the uh, navigation group to see exactly where I am. I know exactly where I am. This is here the severe rectus, here is the lateral rectus. I'm going in between. You don't like to use the bipolar the other way because that would cause the fat to shrink. And if the fat shrinks, then the orbit will go in ophthalmos. You want to preserve the orbital fat. Orbital fat is a nuisance. It is very ugly. It will hinder your dissection, but you have to know how to deal with it. So I know the tumor is here and I'm looking, I'm digging actually for it, but I know exactly where I am. This is the superior rectus, on top of it is the levator papyrus superioris, here is the lateral rectus. I'm going in between this and this lateral left side. <coughs> There's no joke here. Either you know or you don't. But remember, orbit is in the domain of a neurosurgeon. You have to master it. Maybe you will not operate, but you have to master the anatomy and the knowledge of the pathology. And I tell you, you will go into the orbit on so many occasions. Do we train patients? Do we train residents uh, during the residence program in Jordan? No. Orbit is no, no, it's not for the neurosurgeons. And uh, vessels are not for the neurosurgeons. Uh, nothing is for the neurosurgeons. They just have, need to know how to do a shunt, how to do a disc, how to put, a, to put screws in place. And this is not neurosurgery. This is general surgery. Now, this is the lesion. I'm opening it just to make sure that I am in it. I try to debulk it so that I can extract it without putting much pressure on the surrounding tissues. I'm sure now it is cavernoma. I use the ultrasonic aspirator to debunk it from inside, and then I go around it. So here it is. It has to be removed in block, not in pieces, in one block. This and the AVM should be removed in one block. You add to them the hemangioblastomas. Mangioblastomas, cavernomas, and uh, AVMs should be removed as one piece. So here you are. I am Samir Harak al Masrahi, which is our juvenile lesion. And then uh, this is the macrum of land. And this is the roof and the lateral orbit. Okay. <coughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
أو تك من التومينش دكتور إبراهيم منش الفاني في الإسبريشن هو في الهوبي. In my long career doing thousands of fine needle, I did only three fine needle from peri orbital area. For obvious reasons, many people they don't like to do the orbit. But one of them was big in patient with leukemia and he has orbital mass proved to be invasive aspergin losses. The patient treated, but unfortunately he died eventually. One case was for metastatic carcinoma, and one case was for uh, mixed edema. Uh, returning back to the case, this is, was the tumor. If you remember, the, uh, this is, was informally fixed uh, tissue. If you remember the original from the last uh, thing that Dr. Rahim showed, it was a little bit more reddish uh, <clears throat> in the before formally fixation, because formally fixation makes the tissue more uh, shrunk and more like uh, a brownish in color uh, and bluish. So you can see the difference when uh, fixation is there. And uh, usually it's, it's, it's uh, less than usual. For You can give it extra probably 20% before its fixation. And this is not, that was the hemangioma that was uh, uh, removed. You can see typically this is a very much dilated vascular spaces. Uh, the abnormal thing about uh, uh, coprinoma or hemangioma is the vascular, uh, the wall is abnormal. You can see with a vascular space like this, you expect that the wall to be three or four times larger than this, but you can see they are really, really small and they are arborizing channels between each other. And well, that's why uh, they are easy to uh, bleed. And you can see easily hemocytrin. Uh, and sometimes you can see from some fat tissue in between. Again, you can see this is area that has been bled there and fib fibrosis after fibrin formation. You can see recanalization re again and again. This is typical, the pathophysiology of uh, cavernous hemangioma. Uh, again, here you, see, you can see that it's reaching up, the, up to the edge uh, and that's why they sometimes bleed. And uh, you can see the wall. This is not a, a normal wall. This is fibrous wall and usually muscles they have, uh, the muscles are few if you do muscle stain. And uh, these are arborizing channels of dilated vascular spaces. Again, you can see in, this is high, higher power, uh, how these are very much dilated. Uh, here you can see some hyalinized formation, so, uh, fibrosis, and this is fibrin uh, uh, closing some of the channels. Uh, there are three major special immune stains that stains uh, endothelial cells. CD31 is one of them. You can see the brown staining is the one that tells you that this is the wall or the endothelium of the vascular spaces. It's positive as expected. Uh, CD34 is another one and it's positive in the lining, brown staining. And we have also a factor eight. The factor eight sometimes it's weak positivity in, in this normal endothelial cells. Sometimes it's positive in the malignant cells. S100, uh, it stains the uh, fat and nerve. You can see the fatty tissue that I mentioned, and but also you can see some nerve twigs in between the tumor cells. So this tells you if you miss them by immuno by morphology by H and E, highlight them by the uh, S100. B53 is usually negative. This is done specific staining. Uh, key 6 7 was this time one person indicated this is usually not amperophating a tumor. So this final diagnosis was cavernoma. Thank you. Uh, post operative images, the very next day, we don't delay the images, the very next day, we do the proper images, uh, the suitable images, so there's no tumor, the bone work is nice. That's your lateral orbitotomy here. Yeah. And the MRI, not in closes as well. Preserve the neurovascular structures. And that's the patient. Of course, there is always very orbital edema and ecchymosis. This is for up in the clinic. Ecchymosis is less. This is, is the SAR summary, detailed the SAR summary that we are proud that we are one of few in the world who's doing this. 
everything is done to the patient is put in writing. Dr. Mahmoud Nisa was resident then. Now he is uh, passed his exam to the neurosurgeon. Follow up one year, beautiful, no problem whatsoever. And this is the cosmetic appearance. Uh, not just. With this, we finish, and I thank you. Any questions or comments? Please. Okay. I'm Dr. Hussain Al Kharma, a scientist, a surgeon, and an orbital surgeon. I'm going to ask you, Dr. Ibrahim, in a friendly atmosphere, scientific atmosphere. This is our branch, this is our area. This is our bread and butter. This is what we're doing daily basis. يعني مش أنا خوفي إنه مش كل الجراحين بناء زي الدكتور رايم بيعرفوا المعرفة والدكتور فريد. This is our specialty. This is our area. We know exactly each single يعني problem in the orbit. The worry is إنه هلا new generation يطلع ويبلش يتشاطر orbit. At one time, yes, as you said, Dr. رايم correctly as always. Was a neurosurgical specialty. It was. Now these were orbital surgeons dedicated for orbital surgery. We do only only orbits. Akid in Nohna and exposure actor than new neurosurgeons. Ma khas ihtiram Dr. Ray, Dr. Farid, Square. Point taken, and it was mentioned and stressed that uh, since then, these days, it's a neurosurgical field. Since Joseph Malone, it's still a neurosurgical field, and then people came into it including the endoscopies. The best thing is the cooperation between different specialties. We cannot say that this is a ophthalmic. You cannot say this is pure neurosurgery. Each case has its own merits. And I just want to challenge you, Victor, with this case, again, in a friendly atmosphere, and would ask you, what would you do with it? The apical orbital apex. Uh, what is it? Should be here. This one. Okay. Okay. Uh, again, to uh, in this particular problem, no single orbital surgeon should ever touch such a patient. This is your area, definitely, no doubt. It's the main deep to rain patient, pure orbital. No, 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 doctor, don't, don't say that you don't say that you don't say that you don't say that. This patient is a friend of yours or some acquaintance, and he came to you, and you recommended that he comes to me. So don't change words. No, no. When case come to you, you can operate upon it if you like. When the case come to me, I operate it when I like. These cases are for a neurosurgeon. A lot of orbital surgeons, a lot of orbital pathology is for the neurosurgeon. And I agree, a lot of orbital pathology is for the ophthalmologist and oculoplastic surgeon. But don't mix and don't give wrong messages that this is an ophthalmology only. It is not. Any comment, please? Just to refer uh, if uh, orbital uh, venogram is it helpful for the diagnosis of orbital tumors uh, by uh, superficial means uh, orbital venogram? It is useful or not? Um, probably the short answer is not. And the long answer is um, with the imaging we have now between the MRI and the CT and with the conventional and geography that sometimes we do to clarify the, so the nature of the, the lesion and the nature of supply to the lesion, we get the, a venographic phase of the angiogram, so we don't have to percutaneously stick a vein in the, in the, in the eye. Thank you. So, Andrew, have you good Any comments or questions? Please. I want to ask the Dr. Farid. Uh, regarding infraregional granuloma <coughs> injection in glomycin, uh, is it work for uh, an adult case like brain stem <laughs> <laughs> no. So next time you have a brain stem one, you just open the skull for me, I'll stick it in. <laughs> 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 
I don't know. I don't think anybody no, no. tried it. No, but you know, tried it. No one should try it. But pleomycin has been uh, used in other tumors like uh, clavus codomas or C1, C2 codomas, etc. It's still not uh, popularized, but it is uh, being uh, done. Any other questions or comments? Thank you. We'll meet next Wednesday. <laughs>
en los otros uh, lados, sí. En, la, en, en todo está en el centro. restaurantes, en todas partes, wow, qué bueno, sí, maravilloso. Es. ¿Cuánto tiempo va a estar ahí en Madrid? Uh, tres días, este ah, tiempo, sí. pero no tengo trabajo, yo divertirme, yo, yo viajo. Ah, claro. <risa> pero Eso este claro. viaje yo voy a quedar más tiempo. Uh, y también voy a televisar un congreso. ¿De y qué? Es un co congreso de, eh, déjame mostrar, ¿qué es? De neuroradiología intervencional. Oh, interesante. Y esa es la nueva tendencia de la medicina. Uh, Yuha va a estar allá para la tercer año. Yuha. Yeah, Yuha Hernes, Jimmy. Va a estar en Madrid. Sí, él va a estar allá. Él, él le gusta este congreso. De intervencionismo. Sí, él, él va a hablar de aneurismo, yo creo. Ok, uh, déjame, déjame mostrar el congreso de España. Neuro IMC. Saca, ok, aquí es la facultad. No. Tal, tal vez tú conoce uh, algunos. Yo creo que Demetrius Lowe, ese hombre es famoso para Mora um, Mora. Um, ¿Qué enfermedad? Mori Mori disease. Moya Moya. Moya, Moya, Moya bueno, él es muy famoso. Él tiene 1500 casos de China. Él está de China. Es, es famoso Moya, Moya. para Mori Mori. Para... Moya, Moya. Es, eh, pre, es frecuente en Asia. Es muy activo. Él, él habla mucho de esta. Con... Y, y Demetrius López, muchos famosos hombres de ah, sí. in, 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 intervencional. Y nosotros va a televisar. Enero. Yo, yo quiero que trate de integrar la audiencia de internet a la congreso en alguna manera. Uh, porque yo voy a hablar con Luis, el jefe, para tal vez tener un noche o algo donde la internet puede hacer preguntas de... Sí, de sí, algunos. sería bueno. Pero vamos a ver sí. qué, qué pasa. Pero estoy libre para tratar algo. Ojalá se pueda. Sí, sí, pero tú estás bienvenido para mirar, para estar en el panel, para todo, por cualquier, okay. cualquier parte. ¿Tú tienes un radiólogo intervencionista en su hospital en Cuenca o no? <susurra> Sí, sí, aquí hay un radio intervencionista que... Porque no hay es, mucho en cada no, ciudad, no tiene. No, aquí hay uno solo. Uno, sí. Y, y trabaja en stroke, la, la mejor parte es stroke, ¿verdad? Stroke, eh, eh, la eh, trombectomía mecánica, mecánica trombectomía. Oh, sí, 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 stroke, para, para evitar stroke. Para evitar el truco. Que yo he ponido un stent en mi cabeza. Sí, para, yo uh, recuerdo el año pasado. Sí, el año sí, sí. suerte de Dios, pero tengo suerte hasta ahora. Sí, tengo Mejor suerte hasta bien. ahora. Y uh, estoy tomando anticoagulantes, dos, Plavix y Saralta. Tiene uh, que cuidarse mucho. Sí, sí. Eh, pero, pero los golpes. Yo creo que mi sangre es mejor no de muy delgada en vez de yeah. entiende yeah, pues, sí. menos coagulante es mejor ocho por ciento de stroke está coágulo em, embolo uh, vamos yeah. a ver es, es una posta a ver es bad your your heart your heart your heart de, está, bien, que está sí. bien sí su corazón está bien Sí, mi corazón, sí. Antes tengo un hecho uh, arritmia, fibrilación atrial, uh, pero ahora está bien. Una vez fui a uh, atrial fibrilación, fui al hospital, boom, y regresa, uh, pero, uh, sí, no, bien. pero cuando yo tengo atrial fibrilación, wow, es horrible. No tengo claro, energía, sí. no tengo energía. Uh. Yo, yo camino un escalera de... de de, de chairs, stairs, no puedo, un. Un escalera. Sí, mucho. Yeah. Falte, porque yeah. mi corazón no es eficaz, no es eficaz. Yeah. 
es 40% menos que normal. Entonces, uh, yo voy a estar muy agresivo. Si paso otra vez, ok, yo regreso. ¡Bum! <risa> claro que sí, sí. Tiene otra, que estar aquí. otra ablación. Si no sirve, yo voy a otra ablación. Uh, mi, mi hermano tiene <coughs> hecho fibrilación, pero él no parece que tiene tanto debilidad. Mm. Porque algunas personas viven toda su vida. Con, sí, y no pasa nada. Sí, y no pasa nada. Entonces, cada persona es diferente. Sí, cada persona. Entonces, ok. Pero esperemos que tú estés. Estoy arreglando la, la app. app. Tenemos ah. pocos problemas con la app. ¿Tú, tú ah. bajaron la app? Trata, trata sí, de sí. usarlo. Yo tengo app. Yo tengo app Neurosurgica TVC. Sí, es buen, bueno para sí. mirar videos. Sí. Si no tiene yo, algo yo, así, está en el banco, puede mirar videos. Sí, yo aquí estoy promocionando Neurosurgica TV con todos los estudiantes. Oh, qué bueno. Ok, Stuart, nos vemos un rato, ok? Ok, oye, Doc, eh, eh, ¿hay contraseña ahora para entrar a videos? Sí, es muy extraño. Cada... cada, cada cada charla tiene un macro paso diferente. Es muy yeah. extraño. Tú eres la segunda persona hoy que por, tú entra por... ¿Cómo, cómo entra esta? Por, eh, como siempre. Un link. Un, eh, no, no, es, no, no, sí, el link con, directo con eh, el código. Ok. Ok. La próxima vez vaya un link en Facebook. Normalmente okay. en Facebook yo siempre pongo el link. Trata este link la próxima vez, ¿ok? Ok, ok, ok. Ok, nos okay, vemos. Bye. See you. Buen, buen noche. Buenas noches. Okay. Chao, chao. Chao, chao.